As we all know, real estate investment trusts have been hit quite hard from a stock valuation standpoint during this difficult economic climate, mostly attributed to the whole uncertainty around rent collection as a result of the medical issue. With that said, one Canadian REIT was hit much harder than other comparable REITs in Canada and happens to be of high interest to the audience. Hey, what's going on, savers and investors? I hope you're all having a great day. As always, if you're new to the channel, then welcome. My name's Griffin, and in today's video, we're going to be diving into the fourth episode of the Q1 earnings analysis series with today's video covering H&R REIT which was by far the most requested REIT that I cover in this series and happened to have a 16% dividend yield over the past month or so as the price of this REIT has dropped quite significantly and this had many investors messaging me wondering whether or not this was a good REIT pick moving forward. If you're interested in learning more about how REITs are being impacted on a global level in Canada due to the whole medical issue then I highly suggest you watch the video right here as well as the real can analysis video where we dive deeper into the whole macroeconomic landscape of how REITs are being impacted during this difficult situation especially for what has to do with rent collection from many of these large retailers and residential tenants the information in those two videos is really great to pre-frame what we're about to see with H&R REIT but with that said let's get a little bit more context about H&R REIT's operations and portfolio and if at any point in today's video you're enjoying the content and it's providing you value then please make sure to smash the like button it really helps my channel grow and reach a wider audience all right let's first take a look at the current market quote of hr.un which is the ticker symbol on the tsx for hr reit so that we can get a better idea of how the stock is being treated in the open market the last price as of market close on may 15th was eight dollars and 56 cents up 0.23 percent in the day but still down 58.9 91% year to date and down roughly 60.50% since February price points of $21.85 per share. And I'm filming this video on Monday evening, so by the time you watch this, the price points may have changed slightly. These numbers are relatively standard for the REIT sector in Canada, but is actually still underperforming when compared to other large Canadian REITs such as RioCan, Allied Properties, and Canadian Apartments, just to name a few. So in today's video, hopefully we'll be able to to uncover why HR REIT is being hit much harder than other comparable trusts. This current price point has put the market cap at just under 2.5 billion Canadian dollars, a PE ratio of 7.19, and an earnings per share of 1.19. Now, in my recent video going over a comparison of six different Canadian REITs operating in different facets of real estate, Morningstar's forecasted annual revenue growth was a gain of 4.80%, in my opinion, mostly attributed to the fact that this REIT operates in a variety of sectors, such as retail, industrial, office, and residential, making it much more industry diversified than basically every other Canadian REIT. In fact, when comparing this Morningstar earnings projection figure to the other REITs we looked at, it's evident that they were much more bullish on office building and industrial REITs rather than residential and retail REITs with HR being somewhat of a balance. In addition to this, we determined that the FFO per share of HR.UN was at $1.76 or roughly 44 cents per quarter. At the close of 2019, the company also had a decent balance sheet from a total asset versus liability standpoint at $14.483 billion in total assets and $7.04. 44 billion in total liabilities, which for a real estate investment trust that is inevitably going to have higher levels of debt through mortgages, this is a decent and manageable figure. Regarding their short-term assets and liabilities, the trust had 800 million in current assets and 286 million in current liabilities, putting their current ratio at the time at 2.80. Honestly, at the time of filming that video, everything looked quite promising for this REIT to weather through the tough financial period, so today Today we're going to be diving into the Q1 earnings and balance sheet figures in order to get a better idea of why the share price was hit so hard and how the company is adjusting from a financial standpoint. In the case of HR REIT, this Q1 earnings report was only released on May 14th, which is a couple days back, and I've had the opportunity to go through the whole document to highlight the main financial points of interest and come up with some conclusions on where I think the REIT stands even during this very difficult economic period. The main elements we'll cover today are the revenues, the funds from operations, net operating income, balance sheet strength, and then some forward-looking information. But before that, a little bit of context about this REIT, and I'll highlight right off the 
the bat the fact that this REIT did cut their dividend distribution by 50% for the month of May and onwards from 11.5 cents per unit to 5.75 cents per unit in direct response to the uncertainty surrounding market conditions from the medical issue. The trust has stated that this new distribution rate provides additional financing flexibility to absorb any income interruption related to the medical issue in the near future and allow significant capital reinvestment into their properties without increasing the REIT's financial leverage. In addition to this, the new distribution rate is also expected to satisfy the REIT's requirements to redistribute all of its taxable income. It's definitely never fun as an investor to see one of your holdings cut their dividend. I personally hold shares of HR REIT, so it is somewhat of a bummer, especially if it's by 50%. But considering the economic climate we're living through and the numbers that we're going to be looking at in this video, things could be much worse. The bottom line is that this new distribution would still yield an 8% dividend yield on newly purchased shares, which remains an extremely attractive and high yield. It was somewhat inevitable also that at a 16% yield, they would be cutting the dividend and nothing says that it won't be increased again in the future once things are back to normal. So on the first page of the Q1 earnings report, it says that H&R REIT is one of Canada's largest real estate investment trusts with total assets of approximately $13.4 billion as of March 31st, 2020, and that they have ownership interest in a North American portfolio of high quality office, retail, industrial, and residential properties comprising over 40 million square feet, which yeah, this is pretty much all information that we already know. Now the actual breakdown of their fair value investment properties by geographic region are 29% Ontario, 17% Alberta, 9% other Canadian provinces, and then 45% United States. So this is a REIT that operates almost 50-50 in Canada and the United States, bringing quite a bit of diversification from a real estate class perspective, but also from a geographic region perspective. The fair value of investment properties by type of asset is 28% retail, 22% residential, 42% office, and 8% industrial. So again, a very well diversified. Moving on to the financial highlights section, comparing Q1 of 2019 to Q1 of 2020, let's start at the top with the rentals from investment properties, which is the rental income the trust has collected from their tenants during the first three months of the year. And this figure has actually decreased by about 6.4% quarter over quarter. The same applies to the property operating income, down 8.6% to 140.6 million, down from 153.8 million quarter over quarter. Now at face value, this may seem like the trust was struggling from a rent collection standpoint over this first three month period of the year. However, the REIT has indicated an explanation for these truncated figures, stating that the trust has completed approximately $1 billion in asset sales over the past 15 months, with the goal of repositioning its portfolio, enhancing its internal growth profile, and reducing leverage, which in turn is the primary reason for the decrease in rentals from investment properties and property operating income. Simply put, they've been selling off some properties, which has reduced rental and operating income. In fact, when comparing the same asset property operating income, meaning the rental income that they derived from assets they already had in their portfolio that were either not added or sold off during the same Q1 periods, the trust managed to increase this figure by just under 1%, and this takes into account lease termination fees of 0.2 million in Q1 2020 and 5.9 million in Q1 2019, meaning that even with practically no lease termination fees in 2020, which is not high quality recurring revenue anyways, the REITs still managed to increase their same asset property operating income by about 4%, excluding these lease termination fees. This is great to see because it means that the trust is actively increasing rents in their units as they should be. Now, the next two points could be quite alarming when taking them in at face value without getting some additional context about what they mean and how they impact the trust. Starting with the fair value adjustment on real estate assets at a loss of $1.3 billion in Q1 2020, this blows Q1 2019 out of the water and definitely had me alarmed at first when looking at this figure, considering I hold shares of this trust. While this could be interpreted as maybe a loss incurred from selling pieces of real estate, note that this is not the case, rather it's a reassessment of the fair market value for the trust real estate assets, which is conducted every single quarter and highlights the current price that the trust estimates that they could get for their real 
estate if they were to sell it in this period considering the market climate and other factors. This is pretty much the same as if you were to reassess the fair market value of your home every quarter and saw the fair market value fluctuate through time, which obviously you would never do, but with a publicly traded real estate investment trust, this is a practice that many of them conduct for accounting purposes. Basically, this just means that the trust didn't actually sell off $1.3 billion in assets, rather it's a paper loss on the equity value of the real estate assets. Quickly going into more detail on this point, on page 7 of the financial statements, they indicated that this drop in fair market value is mostly attributed to a difficult market situation resulting from the medical situation by accelerating challenging conditions in the retail landscape, impacting the market pricing of retail properties, which let's remember 28% of their portfolio is retail focused. And then also that the energy sector is facing challenges that have impacted the credit quality of many companies operating in the industry. In fact, the fair market value of H&R's retail portfolio has dropped by 659.9 million and the office portfolio has dropped by 679.5 million, which remember are temporary paper losses as the market fluctuates. Management and the board of H&R strongly supported taking a more proactive approach to updating fair market values to ensure prudent financial reporting practices and should the retail industry recover and energy industry conditions improve, H&R will have the opportunity to update fair values as market conditions evolve in the coming quarters. With all that said, I found it very important to go into detail on this point in order to offer all you viewers some proper explanation about what this $1.3 billion loss in fair market value was, but all things considered, unless the trust sells a large portion of their portfolio at a loss in the short term, this should not dramatically impact the day-to-day -day business model of the fund, which is collecting rents from their tenants. One element that is important to keep in mind though, and that could potentially represent a true material loss in the future for the REIT would be if the retail landscape is forever changed as a result of the medical issue and the transition to online shopping in the next 10 years. I honestly think that the medical issue is more of a temporary six month to a year type of setback for retail with still the bulk of all retail sales being in brick and mortar locations in Canada. But as a long term outlook for the next 10 years, for example, it is a possibility that the fair market value of retail real estate would drop in value, having an impact on the value of the trust's assets. But that is just something to keep in mind for the future and doesn't necessarily impact the REIT in the short to medium term. Moving on to the next point, H&R REIT posted a $1.02 billion net loss in the first quarter of the year, which again, it could be very alarming at face value. This, however, is attributed mostly to that $1.3 billion paper loss in fair value, as we just spoke about. And when looking at the comprehensive loss statement, it's quite evident that this is the primary contributing factor. In fact, if we didn't take into account this $1.3 million paper loss, the trust would have posted a $200 and $54 million comprehensive gain over the quarter had we taken everything else into account and not the fair market loss figure. In any case, if you've watched any of my previous REIT focused content, you're most likely aware of the concept known as the funds from operations or FFO for short, which is a much better metric to keep track of a REIT financial health because it doesn't take into account the gain or loss on sale of property or fair market value losses. The FFO only takes into account revenues, depreciation, and amortization, and then subtracts any gains from sale of property, meaning the FFO is much more indicative of the financial viability of a REIT because it only accounts for the high quality rental income derived from their tenants. HR REIT's FFO for Q1 2020 has only declined by 900,000 since Q1 of 2019, translating into an almost flat FFO per share at $0.45, which is good news to see. In fact, when comparing the FFO per share of Q1 2020 to Q4 of 2019, this figure has actually increased by one cent per quarter, which isn't all that much, but still represents a 2.3% increase quarter over quarter. The FFO payout ratio, which is basically the same thing as a dividend payout ratio for a regular company, is 76.5% in Q1 2020, and that is a very healthy for a REIT considering that their whole business model requires 
them to redistribute a high percentage of their earnings back to shareholders. In comparison to this, RioCan's FFO payout ratio was 77.4% in Q1 2020. Now, keep in mind that this FFO figure would be highly impacted if revenue figures were to be truncated from delayed or missed rental income over the course of 2020, so it's going to be very important to properly assess the trust's income generating viability for the rest of 2020, which leads me into the next point, and that is the percent of rental income collected during Q1 and then also April and May. If you remember from my RioCan video, one of the main elements of uncertainty was how severely the revenues would be impacted in Q2 of 2020, and it so happens that HR Reed has included a rent collection table showcasing as of the time of document creation on May 14th, the percentage of rent that was collected for the months of April and May. Let's keep in mind that based on the revenue figures for Q1 that we just looked over, rent collected was basically unaffected, but let's now see how the trust is coping for the start of Q2. Starting with the office tenants representing 44% of the total rent, April and May collection are at 99%, which is phenomenal, not to mention that these figures can increase any day as rents are paid. The next category is retail, representing 33% of the overall rent split between enclosed malls and other, which unsurprisingly is by far the most affected real estate category because many retailers are temporarily shut down and therefore not generating nearly enough revenue to cover their expenses. This was by far the main concern of retail REIT investors, and this shows the damage firsthand. Again, these figures could change any day, but as it currently stands, April rent collection is at only 59% and May collection is at 50%. After going through this table, I'll do some presumptive calculations of possible revenues for the coming months. The next category is residential, representing 17% of total rent, with April collection at 97% and May collection at 92%, which isn't too bad considering that unemployment rates are through the roof right now in both Canada and the United States. Finally, industrial real estate, representing 6% of total rents, is 98% paid up in April and 90% paid up in May for totals of 85% collection in April and 80% collection in May. All this to say that considering the whole medical situation, rent collection is definitely not ideal right now, mainly due to the whole retail portfolio side of things where single tenant and enclosed mall properties are severely lacking from a rent perspective. I think that this was somewhat expected by pretty much all retail REIT investors, but this table really opens your eyes to how drastic this situation has become, with most likely similar or even worse figures for other retail-focused REITs such as, say, smart centers, for example. Now again, these figures could change at any moment, but let's consider that Q1 rent were 98% collected and that the figures for April and May get slightly better, increasing by 5% per month, with June being at 80% collected. This theoretical figure would put total weighted rent collected at 85% of Q1 revenue. So at 85% of Q1's 279.7 million rentals from investment properties, this would put Q2 rentals at $237.15 million, which would definitely be detrimental on a short-term basis, don't get me wrong, but if compared to say Air Canada, where they are only operating at 10% capacity, things for this read could be much worse, and keep in mind that this is only a theoretical situation. What is favorable for HR read right now is their real estate diversification, allowing them to collect rents in office, industrial, and residential real estate properties. Let's now dive into the balance sheet of HRE to see how they're coping from an asset and liability standpoint. As of March 31st, 2020, the company's real estate assets sit at $11.79 billion, split between investment properties already owned and then also properties under development, which appears to be significantly lower than at close of year 2019, but keep in mind that this does take into account the $1.3 billion in lower fair market value of their buildings. Cash and cash equivalents have increased slightly with total assets actually staying relatively flat if we were to not consider that paper $1.3 billion loss. From a liability standpoint, the trust has actually managed to lower its total liabilities by about $200 million, and this is primarily attributable to the debt section, where HR has paid off the entirety of their Series P and Series F senior debentures, which 
both carried the highest interest rates of their outstanding debentures for a total of roughly $337.5 million. It's always great to see a company work on lowering their debt levels, especially since these debentures are not mortgage debt. Speaking of mortgage debt, however, HR's closing mortgage balance as of March 31st, 2020 has increased slightly from the unfavorable exchange rate American outstanding mortgages and since they didn't repay any mortgages down in Q1 2020. Finally, the debt to total assets of HR REIT was 47.9% at March 31st, which is quite standard for a real estate investment trust as it's in the nature's company to carry a higher level of mortgage debt and in contrast to this, RioCan's debt debt to asset ratio is 43%, which is quite low. All in all, nothing too major in HR's balance sheet that stands out to me. In fact, they have a debt to equity ratio that is healthy and lower than many other Canadian REITs and having lowered their distributions, the trust should be in no real issue to stay afloat even with potentially truncated revenues. Now that we have a good idea of HR REIT's income, balance sheet, and operations during this first quarter of 2020, let's speak about what my final thoughts are on the company. First off, after reading through most of this quarterly income statement document, it's clear that the REIT will be facing some temporary financial setbacks in the coming months, but considering the scope of financial damage in the broader economic landscape, things could be much worse, all things considered. What has saved HR REIT has been their diversification of a real estate asset categories operating in office, retail, residential, and industrial, which allowed them to maintain a relatively high rent collection in their overall portfolio, and this is favorable for shareholders also. Keeping this in mind, based on Q1 earnings, the fund has still managed to maintain an FFO per share of $1.80 over the four quarters, which is actually four cents off from the FFO per share of RealCan during this same Q1 period. It's evident that the FFO per share will be impacted in Q2 earnings reports if their rent collection doesn't increase with rental income from retail being somewhat of a red flag to keep an eye on. With that said, the current share price point is down roughly 60% with market negativity already heavily priced in and I don't particularly believe that this REIT deserves such a harsh investor outlook. And management of the REIT has taken precautionary steps to further solidify its liquidity through taking on 425 million dollars in unsecured lines of credit from a syndicate of four Canadian banks. As far as I can tell from these documents, the REIT is taking the correct measures to respond to the changing economic climate caused by the medical issue. Now, one of the main elements that has investors either upset or worried is the REIT trimming their dividend distribution by 50%, which I agree is unfortunate and could be somewhat of a red flag in normal economic periods. But considering that the REIT has decreased its operating expenses, and is using any saved capital to cover for missed rental income, this is simply the right thing to do. As an investor in a company, it makes more sense to have the company maintain capital to cover truncated revenues and pay for its expenses rather than have the company bleed itself out through maintaining a high dividend. Even at that, the current dividend yield is now roughly 8% and will most likely recover in the coming years once this medical situation is behind us and the company raises their dividends back up. The next point that I'd like to bring up is the fact that the equity per unit has gone down by $3.08 since Q1 2019, but the unit price has gone down by $12.17 since Q1 of 2019. So on a relative basis, you're actually getting in on the REIT's equity from assets at a much better price point right now than in the previous calendar year. Finally, at a current price point of under $9 per share with a lot of negativity priced into the stock already, we'll have to see how the market it reacts to the REIT cutting their dividend, and based on the projected truncated rents for April and March in their retail portfolio, I could see the stock price continue falling down to even a $7 price point. It's definitely not out of the question in my view, but do I think that this is justified? Not necessarily. I personally own quite a few shares of HR REIT already that I picked up in the $9 range, but would be comfortable picking up more in the $7 range. So this REIT was by far one of the most requested companies that I analyzed in this Q1 earnings analysis series over the past couple of weeks. And with the release of their Q1 earnings only a couple days ago on May 14th, I jumped on the opportunity to make this video for the audience. I really hope you enjoyed today's analysis video. And if you have any questions or comments, make sure to leave them down in the comment section down below. And while you're at it, make sure to smash the like button. It really helps my channel grow 
funnel and reach a wider audience. Feel free to also let me know down in the comments which other companies you'd like me to analyze in this Q1 earnings analysis series. I'm gonna be covering quite a few more in the coming weeks or so, and I'd love to know your suggestions. And if you're interested in learning more about stock market investing, then make sure to subscribe to the channel so that you're notified whenever I release one of these new videos on either stock market investing or personal finance. On that note, thanks a lot for watching today's video. And if you're interested in seeing one of my other Q1 earnings analysis video, make sure to check out one of these two right here. And on that note, thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next one.